Good day, everyone, and welcome to today's Living Life. I've had the honor and privilege of being a pastor uh, for quite a few years now. And I remember when I was ordained, I don't know, about eight, six, six, seven, eight years ago, um, I was away at a retreat as part of the ordination process. And we had a very esteemed pastor and professor, seminary professor, come and speak. And uh, in his message, he said something that will stay with me for the rest of my life. And it's something that I will always remember even as I minister at any given in, uh, point in time. And roughly translated, because he spoke in Korean, uh, translated uh, and paraphrased, he said, pastoral ministry is not for human beings to do, uh, as in it's not, for, it's not something for people to do, as in human uh, people specifically. And um, that's, that stuck with me, and I just thought it was one of the most profound things I have ever heard, because in some sense, it is a very human thing to do, but if you really think about it, it is supernatural. It is trying to be involved in something that is very supernatural on behalf of God, for God, on behalf of the people of God, for the people of God, as we stand in between. And we stand as conduits, as pastors of sorts, between God and the masses, especially if you kind of think about the Catholic tradition, you see that most powerfully. And it's a burden that should not be taken lightly. And the quote has been drilled into me uh, to this day. And in today's pa uh, passage, we see first the first-hand intervention of God, and then God also using people, or in this case, a person, as his intermediary. So, and the theme that we're going to see is protecting people from themselves. So let's read the passage, and then we'll continue. Deuteronomy chapter 4 verses 41 through 49. Then Moses set aside three cities east of the Jordan, to which anyone who had killed a person could flee if they had unintentionally killed a neighbor without malice aforethought. They could flee into one of these cities and save their life. The cities were these, Bezer in the wilderness plateau for the Reubenites, Ramith in Gilead for the Gadites, and Goland in Bashan for the Manassites. This is the law Moses set before the Israelites. These are the stipulations, decrees, and laws Moses gave them when they came out of Egypt, and were in the valley near Beth Peor east of the Jordan, in the land of Sihon, king of the Amorites, who reigned in Heshbon and was defeated by Moses and the Israelites as they came out of Egypt. They took possession of his land and the land of Og, king of Bashan, the two Amorite kings east of the Jordan. This land extended from Aroer on the rim of the Arnon Gorge to Mount Sirion, that is Hermon, and included all the Arabah east of the Jordan, as far as the Dead Sea below the slopes of Fishka. Now, the passage uh, can be divided into two easy parts. The first is a short section on the cities of refuge, and the second is an introduction uh, before Moses' second address to the people of Israel as they are on the verge of entering the Promised Land. Now, the first, the cities of refuge, uh, it's a very curious, not just passage or section, uh, because it's, uh, it comes out in a couple of different books in the Old Testament, uh, mentioned a few times and explained at greater lengths elsewhere as well. Uh, but they're basically cities uh, strategically spread out through the country, through the land, uh, for someone who kills another person unintentionally, in modern day you would call a manslaughter, right? Um, to, for them to run to and they, where they can find refuge and be a safe haven from harm um, and from revenge um, yeah, until due process can be followed. That's just a very short nut nutshell um, explanation of what they were for. And, you know, I'm sure you've watched movies of the wild, wild west, you know, where uh, you see cowboys and, you know, just the old towns where it's chaos, not just kind of in terms of the, the buildings or the muddy streets, but where justice is something for the select few. 
right? Where if you have a gun and the, pe and the people with the fastest guns win and they rule, right? And there are bandits and outlaws everywhere and they run, run rampant. And so justice is a luxury um, and uh, even safety and concern uh, is only an ideal for people to struggle through day by day. It's absolutely wild, you know, as you see. And, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of Hollywood involved uh, kind of thing, but at the same time, I'm sure it was like that, maybe even worse. Now, the thing is, when was the wild, wild west? It's actually only about, it's less than 200 years ago. It's about 150 to 200 years ago. That's not a very long time, honestly. Now, today's passage is thousands of years ago. And we're talking about a group, a huge group of people who are former slaves. And they are without a true identity. They have no king or ruler. And they are easily led astray. And they have no self-control, as you know in the history of the Israelites um, in the desert, in the wilderness. Now, to this people and situation, God gives order and justice for them to follow and to live by and for them to learn about who he is and how to have a relationship with him. And even if it was an accident, if someone has a small part in the death of someone you love, how would you react? I mean, you know, what would be the first thought that comes out? You know, what would you think that they deserve? Right? I won't say it out loud, but I'm sure, you know, death would, would be involved, you know, suffering and, you know, and so forth, right? You'll be greeting your teeth. I mean, it might also be hard to imagine it, really, if you haven't gone through something like that. But if that was true, right, what would you think that they deserve? The cities of refuge did not mean that God let people off the hook completely. You know, just run there and then you're like, you're perfectly safe. You can live there for the rest of your life. It wasn't that, but it gave room for due process so that true justice, actual justice, can occur. Not human justice, uh, which is often twisted according to the desires of the few, or uh, it can easily be subjected to fleshly passion, but true, real justice. And then something that we you know, cannot achieve by ourselves and for ourselves, you know, this true justice. And we have to remember this as we go into the second part of the passage, where Moses uh, is getting ready to address uh, the people of Israel for the second time, and it's a huge chunk. It goes from chapter 5 to chapter 26. And uh, chapter 4, verse 1, and chapter 5, verse 1, you know, kind of a, like a bracket to today's passage, not an exact bracket, but it gives a good indication of the kind of position and heart that Moses is talking from. Uh, reading the NLT version, chapter 4, verse 1 says, And now, Israel, listen carefully to these decrees and regulations that I am about to teach you. Obey them so that you may live, so that you may enter and occupy the land that the Lord, the God of your ancestors, is giving you. Chapter 5, verse 1, Moses called all the people of Israel together and said, Listen carefully, Israel. Hear the decrees and regulations I am giving you today, so you may learn them and obey them. A lot of similarities. Moses basically stands before the people as a pastor slash teacher who is seeking to inspire his people, his audience, with a particular vision of God and to convince them, influence them, teach them to live in this way. Moses is not teaching them, you know, something that he made up or he developed or, you know, his ideas or opinions, but decrees and regulations, which means a set standard that is above the people that he was talking to. Moses sets himself up as an intermediary who passes on information. And by now, the people that he's talking to, they're the children of former slaves who were born in the wilderness, still very young, and who have barely any edu education. And you can see that how these two parts set up, are set up to protect people from themselves. Two key words that I mentioned were refuge and shepherd. Psalm 46 says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. And then Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. And later John chapter 10, Jesus himself says that I am the good shepherd. Everything converges through the Old Testament into the new, into our lives now, where Jesus is the great mediator 
Jesus is the Son of Man, the Son of God, who was sent to protect and save a world from themselves even. So again, these two words that I would like to apply for ourselves today, refuge and shepherd. Even if we were to make a, a tremendous mistake that harms others and ourselves, we have a refuge to turn to. I know, you know, through the last couple of weeks with the whole coronavirus uh, situation, a lot of people, well, something that a lot of people were afraid of is, what if I get infected and I infect other people? I know that's something that I was worried about, even just beyond my children and family. But you know, that feeling of even pre-guilt, Let's turn to Christ, who is our refuge and strength, and also Him, God, uh, Jesus, being the good shepherd. When we are totally lost and you know, devoid of hope, He is the shepherd that guides us. So let's turn to Him, seek Him this very day, and for our entire month as well. Let's pray. God, we thank You uh, for Your Word that strengthens, strengthens us, us and gives us hope, O oh Lord to a people who are unable to protect and help themselves, to lead themselves, provide for ourselves, Lord. You give us ordinances, words, commands, decrees and regulations, all for our own good, to help us because we are unable. Lord, may we learn of our inability so that we can turn to you who is completely able, who is our refuge, who is our shepherd, Lord. So we turn to you now, your son, Jesus, as the word of life. We turn to you, O Lord. Grant us life this day. Protect us this day, O Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. This program is produced by the listeners of the audience. 